Thank you, Doctor. Um, I now recognize myself for five minutes. <clears throat> this question is for is for all the witnesses. You've all used uh, similar terminology in your testimonies, like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning, um, so that we can all start off on the same page. Uh, I'll start with Dr. Kasturi, but would y'all could you explain what these terms mean and how they relate to each other? In the interest of time, I'm going to divvy these up. Dr. Kasturi, you take artificial intelligence. Dr. Yellett, you take machine learning. Dr. Nielsen, you take deep learning. All right, Doctor, you're up. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Chairman Weber. That, that's an excellent question. In the interest of time, I'm not going to speak about artificial intelligence. There are clearly experts sitting next to me. I'm interested in the idea of finding natural intelligence wherever we can. Uh, and I would say that the confusion that exists in these terminologies also exists when we think about intelligence beyond the artificial space. And I'm happy, at a, perhaps after I let the other scientists speak, to, to talk about how we define natural intelligence different ways, which might help elucidate the ways we define artificial intelligence. All right, fair enough, Dr. Yellick. Do you feel that monkey on your back? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question. So um, let me try to cover a little bit of all three. So artificial intelligence is a very uh, longstanding area, subfield of computer science looking at how to make computers behave uh, with com human-like behavior. And um, one of the most powerful techniques for some of the sub-problems in artificial intelligence, such as computer vision and speech processing, are uh, machine learning algorithms. These algorithms have been along for around, uh, around for a long time, but the availability of large amounts of labeled data and large amounts of computing have really made them take off in terms of being able to solve those, um, those artificial intelligence problems in certain ways. Um, the specific type of machine learning, machine learning is a broad class of algorithms that come from statistics and, uh, and computer science, and, uh, but the specific class is called deep learning algorithms. And I won't go into the details. I will defer that if somebody else wants to try to ex explain deep learning algorithms, but, um, but they are used for these particular um, breakthroughs in artificial intelligence. I would say that the popular press often equates the word artificial intelligence with the term deep learning because the algorithms have been so powerful and so that can create some confusion. All right, thank you, Dr. Nielsen. Yes, I'm not an expert in deep learning, but we are practitioners of deep learning at GE. And really it's taking off, taken off in, I would say, the last several years as we've seen a rise in big data. So we have nearly 300,000 assets spread globally and each one generating gigabytes of data. Now you, processing that gigabytes of data and trying to make sense of it, we're using deep learning techniques. It's a subfield, as you mentioned, of machine learning algorithms, but allows us to extract more information, more relationships, if you will. So for example, we use deep learning to help us build a computer model of a combined cycle power plant. Very complex system, very complex thermodynamics. And it's only because we have been able to collect now years and years of historical data and then process the through deep learning algorithms. So for us, deep learning is a breakthrough enabled by advances in computing technology, advances in big data science, but uh, and it's allowing us to build what we think is more complex uh, models of not only our assets, but the processes that they perform. Uh, Dr. Ouellette, before you answer, you issued a warning, quite frankly, in your, in your statement that there's been more patents filed by some of the foreign countries than, than we are. Do you attribute that to what we're, what we're talking about here? Go ahead. Uh, in very simple terms, I think what I'm calling attention to is investment level in, in the science that underpins all kinds of things. So whether it be um, the biology of the brain, the functioning of the brain, or how you make machines work, how you construct machines, control algorithms, so on and so forth. That's really what I'm trying to get at. Okay. And I'm trying to give you some support, some ammunition that what you're doing as a committee, set of subcommittees, is really worthwhile. Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Let me move on to the second question. Several of you mentioned your reliance on DOE facilities, which is, again, what you're talking about, particularly light sources and supercomputing, which is we are focused on and, and been to a, a couple of those, uh, for, the big, for the types of big data research that you all all perform. And how my question is how necessary is it for the United States to keep up to date, you've already addressed that with the patents uh, statement and warning that you issued. But what I want to know is have any of y'all, uh, would you opine on who the nearest competitor is and have you interfaced with any scientists or individuals from those companies and if so, in what field and in what way? Doctor? 
I would say that the internationally, the sort of the nearest two competitors to us are Germany and China. And in general, in the scientific world, there is a tension between collaboration and competition, independent of whether the, the scientist is, lives in America or doesn't live in America. I think the good news is that for us, at least in neuroscience, we realize that the scale of the problem is so enormous and, and has so much opportunity, there's plenty of food for everyone to eat. Uh, so right now, we live at the world of cooperation between individual scientists where we share data, share problems, and share solutions back and forth. I'm less, of course, familiar with what happens at levels much higher than that. Thank you, Dr. Yellick. Yes, in the area of high-performance computing, I would say the, um, the closest uh, competitor at this point is, is China. And um, in science, we also look, like to look at derivatives. So what we really see is that uh, China is growing very, very rapidly in terms of their leadership. Um, at this point, we do have the fastest computer uh, and the top 500 list in the US. But of course, until recently, that was uh, the, top, the uh, top two, the number one and three machines were from China. But perhaps more importantly than that, um, there are actually more machines uh, manufactured manufactured in China on that list than there are machines that are manufactured in the U.S. So there is a huge and growing interest and, um, and certainly a lot of research, uh, much, a, lot, a lot of funding in China for artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all of that applied to science and other problems. Have you met with anybody from over in China involved in that field? Yes, last summer I actually did a tour of all of the, the major supercomputing facilities in China. Um, so I got to see the, what were the number one and number three machines at that time and was very impressed by the, the scientists. I think one of the things that you see, and, and a lot of, by the way, very junior scientists, the, the uh, students that they are training in these areas, um, they use these machines to also draw talent uh, back to China from the U.S. or uh, to, keep, to keep talent uh, that was trained in China in the U.S. And they are really, they have very impressive people in terms of of the, uh, uh, the computer scientists um, and uh, computational scientists. Uh, Dr. Nielsen, very quickly, because I'm out of time. Yes, I would just like to echo that, uh, like Dr. Rollett, we follow publications and patents, and we're seeing a growing number from China. So I'd like to echo that just from that statement. We're seeing uh, a growing interest in the use of high-performance computing to go look at things like cybersecurity from China. So obviously, uh, that's the number one uh, location we're looking at. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rollett. I'm going to have to move on now. So I'm now going to recognize the gentlelady from Oregon for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, what an impressive panel and what a great 